Hello and welcome everyone. I have another wonderful guest today on my diversity, culture, and equity series. I have Sharika Bentham, who is a clinical director and speech language pathologist, and she's the owner of Easy Speak Enterprises, who brings with her 11 years of knowledge and expertise in the field of speech language pathology. She currently resides in Barbados in the Caribbean, and she received her master's in speech language therapy from the University of Auckland in New Zealand. And she is a registered member of the New Zealand Speech Language Association, as well as an international affiliate with the American Speech Language and Hearing Association. She has lots of specialized training included in the Hannon It Takes Two to Talk program, SOS approach to feeding and is level one prompt training. She also continues to pursue quite a bit of professional development in a variety of areas, such as augmentative and alternative communication, speech sound disorders, phonological awareness and literacy, which is a big area of interest of mine, as well as with autistic children. And she also has special interest in early intervention and parent coaching. So thank you so much for coming today. And we're going to focus primarily today on the, the issues of um, topics of diversity, equity, and early intervention. I know you serve a variety of clients in your clinic, so I want you just to share a little bit more about your clinic in Barbados and what you're doing to serve the children and families there currently. Yes. Well, I see quite a range of um, children and adults, actually. Um, it's, it's a pretty hectic caseload, I would say. Um, I really enjoy working in early intervention. Um, I think I say early intervention probably about 50 times a day because, you know, the research has shown that, you know, as early as you can get a child, you can see a child, assess, provide support to the families, provide that intervention, that the results are greater. So I, I always push for that early intervention in my practice. I mean, I see a range because I, I work a lot in autism and the majority of my caseload is on the autistic spectrum. But then there's that piece of EI and autism, early intervention and autism that come together as well. And I'm so glad that we are seeing more of that early, early identification. And as speech therapists, we advocate a lot for that early identification of any of those red flags, whether it be autism, speech and language disorders, you know, the range of communication disorders there. So it's, it's a nice wide range. I enjoy doing it. I enjoy doing functional therapy, a mixture of clinic-based clinic therapy and routine-based therapy at home. So it's nice to be able to have that flexibility. Yes, definitely. I know that routine-based therapy, especially for the little ones, it's very yes. important to, to serve them in their natural environment. And I know with early intervention, how do you specifically advocate in your community to get the word out of the importance of early intervention services for children with potential speech language, communication language, or feeding therapy needs? How do you advocate? Well, it's, glad, it's good that you say so today because I was on national TV yesterday nice. um, doing lots of talking on communication milestones, recognizing communication difficulties in children, um, and saying early intervention probably about 50 times in the interview. Um, the thing about it is that the biggest thing in community, in Caribbean community, is pushing for awareness. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people don't know, they, they see special needs, and I said this yesterday, they see special needs as children with severe autism or children in wheelchairs or, you know, people with severe disabilities, Whereas a special need is anything that needs any need that ha you need support for, right? So any communication difficulty, any feeding difficulty, any sort of even challenging behavior. Um, I said yesterday, even wearing glasses is a special need mm -hmm. because anything that supports you functioning each day in your everyday life, your everyday interactions. So I really push for education, awareness. Um, I work with Another colleague of mine, Tej, we do EIEIO on Instagram and we try to post as much as possible when our busy lives don't take over. Um, we try to post as much as possible about recognizing com early communication milestones, recognizing red flags, things you can do at home, simple basic language things that you can do at home in general routines like bath time, bedtime. Um, to support your child's language development, whether it be typically developing 
or language delayed. So it's really advocated and pushing. Um, a big thing we've been working on a lot more is also preschool awareness and preschool mm -hmm. education because that's where a lot of the kids go from very, very early. And you know, a lot of the teachers aren't really sure what to look for in a child who, you know, if they have any sort of communication difficulty and also how to support these difficulties from a very early age. Yes, I think awareness is definitely key, especially letting the families know and the pediatricians. I know when I did early intervention years ago, we do a lot of um, in-service with the pediatricians to let them know, you know, of course, they're definitely well-trained in medical needs and all that. Right. It is okay to write a prescription or a referral for a child to come to speech therapy if they're one and two and, you know, years of age, the earlier it is better because that way that when they go to preschool and kindergarten, they will be ready and not so far behind their receptive and expressive language needs. So that is definitely very important. And I love that you're sharing information on your blog and so forth for parents, yeah. things that they can do, simple things at home with home routines, whether it's bath time, meal time, play, children learn right. through play, structured play, yes. and um, just free play, how that's important. And, and now with COVID and all that, getting them outside, <laughs> things are definitely yeah. getting better here in the yeah. station worldwide, yeah. and making sure kids can get outside and play and use that as an opportunity to build skills. Um, but I think advocacy, like you say, is very important and awareness, right? Making sure that children, and the families are aware that it's okay to get services early. You know, it's not to their detriment, it's to a benefit, basically, you know? Yeah, definitely. Yes. And how do you and your team involve parents even more so in the therapy process so that children with special needs have the greater access to those practice opportunities like we were just talking about so that they can build their essential skills? Yeah, we push so much for a family-centered approach to mm -hmm. therapy. Um, our goal, and I tell parents this all the time, we're the coach. That's what we are. We're mm -hmm. not just here to do therapy with your child. We're here to coach you through the process. Because you see us, what, 30 minutes, mm -hmm. an hour a week. And then you have all the rest of that time to work with your child and to implement all these strategies so we're trying as much as possible to get parents involved so they're not just sitting back and watching. Initially, I will admit, when I first started working, it was all me, 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 doing the therapy with the child. Oh, look, he just did this. And I've realized afterwards that the parents have no clue how to implement it. So I realized the importance of coaching the parent through it and saying, you know, it's okay if he doesn't do this, or it's okay if you made a mistake, because some parents might go, oh, I asked too many questions. I'm like, that's okay. That's part of the learning process. And that's why I'm here to support you and guide you through it. Because, and we've seen so many great results. And I'm saying, it's not because of me. It's, that's all you. That's all you changing your language strategies. That's all you waiting and listening and, you know, giving that child a, a chance to fill in his turn and to respond. And you're getting that interaction going. I find it so critical, especially in ASD, working with kids on the spectrum, especially those teenies that they aren't acknowledging your presence and they're not, you know, engaging with you. Mm -hmm. And parents tend to shy away or, you know, kind of retreat because they're not sure how to interact with this child now. And I find that that parent coaching element is huge in making sure that parents are, become more comfortable stepping out of that box and having that active engagement with their children. Um, what I've started to do recently um, within the last couple of weeks is have sessions to that don't even include the child. And that's actually going back to hand and base strategies where we're sitting and we're talking, we're saying, you know, what's working, what's not working? Let's problem solve together. How can we support this? Can I come into the home and add some visuals? You know, so we're working as a team. It's not me being here as a therapist. You know, I could tell you so many things, but if we're working as a team, we get so many results and faster results too. I like that, um, being able to use a hand and um, strategy for the mm -hmm. parent coaching that the child is not there to, because that way you're really doing great parent education. You can model for them to, this is how yeah. you use this particular strategy. This might be what a language expansion means or the different terminology. You can go over some of the speech language lingo that we would use 
but break it down to them in a way that they understand. That way in therapy, when you say those words, they understand what is it that you want them to model in the natural home environment, whether they're at the park or at the playground or at home, what are those strategies that you want them to use so that their child can basically generalize the skills that they're learning in therapy with the two times a week. So um, I really like those, the hand and it takes to, um, really can you talk a little bit about that some more? Um, I did the Hannah and It Takes Two to Talk program probably eons ago. I feel okay. like <laughs> I feel it's like probably about nine nine okay. years ago now. Um, but I still I don't do the full program. I don't do the full group program. Mm -hmm. But I always take all those aspects and I go through each piece: the obs the owling, the observing, waiting, and listening is sparking an interaction using routines and you know I get the parents down on the ground and we're doing row row roll your boat right I let them send me videos and we talk through it and I say you know what happened there what did you do there that was good what could have you could you have waited a little bit more in that aspect too so I really like that coaching program and that is so parent-led um, and it, it really addresses a lot of parents needs Yes, I think it's very important that it's parent-led because like you said, they're they're with their child <laughs> the majority of the day unless they're with a, a caregiver. And yes. So it's definitely yes. important to have that buy-in from the parent for them to understand because we want communication, especially with early intervention, to be functional services. And I, and I know that in your clinic that you, you've also been providing some teletherapy services. What kind mm -hmm. of communication disorders and clients have responded well recently to teletherapy services provided by your clinic? And do you provide those services just in Barbados or throughout the diaspora in the Caribbean or other places? Um, I've been providing throughout the Caribbean. So Bermuda, Jamaica, um, St. Vincent, St. Lucia. Um, I've been able to, Turks and Caicos coming up too. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that has been really good. It has been a learning, a learning experience because we were thrown into it with COVID, and you had to do. We had to do so much training to, to be good at it. That's it to make it work for us. And to, I think as speech therapists, we're so adaptable and so flexible and um, amazing in how we can change. We can take something like Zoom or you know any sort of teletherapy platform and make it work for us, whether it be, I mean, before I used to have a nice big green screen that I made with paper behind mm -hmm. and, you know, doing all sorts of crazy things um, with the green screen and using these fun backgrounds and keeping kids engaged. I find that it worked well for the beginning of that parent coaching process because we got eyes into parents' homes. So we were able to see more of the kids in their naturalistic environments and see what they're doing. We could do, I mean, I would have parents with cameras set up next to bathtubs and me, they're like, oh my goodness, if they fall, <laughs> I, I am not liable for this. I mean, we set up in the kitchen, we set up all over the house and it was really good for that early intervention piece. I mean, I definitely miss my hands on holding on to the kids sort of approach. You know, because I like to spin kids and I like to bounce them on the trampoline and everything. But it was still good to have that aspect of it, of having the parents do things and seeing what toys they have in the home and seeing what materials we had, whether it be toys or whether it be a wooden spoon and a pot, you know, that we can work with and really support them in that area. Um, another area. Yeah, it is. So that language is everywhere, right? Language is everywhere. everywhere. <laughs> Yes, but another thing that I realized that worked well over um, over teletherapy was fluency. I did a lot of um, disfluency stuttering mm -hmm. um, over the COVID period because I found lots of stuttering came out over the COVID period with everything that was going mm -hmm. on. Stutters and so forth. Yep, definitely. Um, so I found that worked really well via teletherapy but I absolutely hated speech sound disorders over teletherapy. It's tricky, especially S and Z. Those are the ones yeah. <laughs> well, those are tricky to work on. You know? And they're like, mom, did he say that right? Did he say that? Was that S clear? Because <laughs> I'm, I'm not hearing it well, even though I had on the headphones. Um, I'm not hearing it as well as I would like to. And I'm just there kind of easing to the computer, like if it would make me hear it better. Yeah, that was tricky. 
Yeah, so it's good to know that um, the clients with um, stuttering or stammering disorder, that those worked, um, what worked quite a efficiently for yeah. um, teletherapy. And then the early intervention kids and how you're able yeah. to put up different areas of the house to get them, the parents to model different um, strategies and so forth to build those functional communication skills. Very good. I wanted to talk a little bit now about your previous training that you did for speech pathology in New Zealand. So what was your experience like pursuing graduate studies in New Zealand? And um, you can start there first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was really good. I mean, it was tough because it was on a whole other side of the world. Um, I had no idea of anything about New Zealand before I went. I mean, just what I read on the on the internet and Lord of the Rings, which I didn't even watch. And, you know, I had no clue where I was going, what I was, you know, going to see and experience. But it was really, I went with an open mind and it was an amazing experience. It was different in having to learn about different new cultures. Mm -hmm. And that was a huge aspect of it. New Zealand is very, very big, especially in that grad program on cultural competency. So. There's so many different cultures from like the Maori culture, the Pacific Islanders, um, uh, the Asian cultures, the Indian cultures. I mean, we did a whole, a whole project on the Hindi language and breaking it down. So that was very interesting to note. Um, a difficult part was learning phonology because the accent, the accent, um, is completely different. Okay, so having to learn to learn all those vowels and how they pronounce certain things, and the intonation and the prosody, um, how they're saying the words, and them understanding me and what I'm saying too. So that was a, an interesting cultural barrier within the program. Yes, and I'm sure you learned a lot about cultural assessments, I would imagine, to distinguish if it's a, you know, articulation disorder or just a difference based on dialect or, you know, the intonation and so forth. Yeah, definitely. That's, that's good. And have you attended professional trainings affiliated with the New Zealand Speech Language Association? I haven't. I'm actually about to do uh, another fluency course, okay. um, fluency training, and that's going to be in New Zealand, so I have to stay up really late because there's okay. 17 hours ahead. Okay. Um, but I really enjoyed it. Um, it's an advanced course of LIDCOM training. Oh, so I did enjoy it when I was over there. And I found out that my old tutor, my old fluency tutor, Anna, she's going to be teaching the course. So I said, I really would like to do that. Mm -hmm. um, before that, no, I haven't engaged as much as I should with the New Zealand Speech Therapy Associ Association. I'm just a member. Um, and I've done supervision. Uh, well, then clinical supervision but will supervising students through them but I haven't taken as much advantage of the training there that I should have. I usually do it through American the ASHA or any American webinars and workshops. Yes I know we met about like, probably about 10 years ago now that we met in ASHA in Florida. Yeah. yeah. I think back in 2014. Mm -hmm. So what do you think are the benefits as a therapist in the Caribbean attending ASHA? What have been it's really good because in the Caribbean, we're so isolated. I mean, there's seven therapists, I think there's seven or eight therapists for the whole country here now. And then there's so many Caribbean countries that don't have a therapist or then some others might have two and others might have three. So we don't have that experience of being in a company where you have this huge network of speech and language therapists to bounce ideas off of or to move between jobs or positions and to have that networking opportunity. So when we're able to go and, you know, come together, I feel like my first ASHA, I was awestruck. I was like, whoa. <laughs> and there were just all these speech therapists in one room. There were thousands and thousands. And, you know, you're looking around and they're all wearing their badges and you're like, everybody's just like me. Whereas, you know, back then there were like three of us or four of us in my country. And I didn't even know of any of the others from the Caribbean yet. So it's so good to be able to have that networking opportunity and to build on that. Because I mean, from then I had Twitter. That was my network <laughs> opportunity to meet people and to learn from them. So, since then, we have Caribsha, which is a yeah. Caribbean Speech and Hearing Association. I'm actually now getting into more discourse with them. Yeah, that, yeah. yeah because they have quite a few now, quite a few speech therapists, and it's good to have that Caribbean network so that you can have that cultural unity and we have that common ground culturally. 
Right. And you can talk about different cases and different treatment approaches and things that may work best for the clientele that you serve, whether it's the children and the adults. So I know attending the courses and conferences and professional development training with ASHA, I have found it very beneficial over the years when I've gone to conferences. And yeah. With you, you know, and what are some strategies that you use to ensure that you are culturally responsive to the clientele that you're serving in Barbados? Um, I'm very aware and I think I've become very even more aware of the impact of things like dialect and, and you know, grammatical aspects of the dialect and language on things like standardized testing or how we do therapy, how we talk in therapy. Um, because when you compare certain things, I, I'm always thinking in the back of my mind, that can be a dialectal something right? That can be, for example, we would say, I hungry, as opposed to I am hungry. Um, yeah. yeah, that's not a cultural, that's not a language problem. That's not a language difficulty, because he would say, oh, there's morphological, and there's that sentence structure mm -hmm. and syntax. That's how we do, we break up sentence structures right. so much in our dialect, or in, yeah, in our Bajan dialect, um, in our everyday interactions. So you always have to be zooming in, and seeing how that affects, you know, performance on standardized testing, understanding of what we're telling children too, and understanding of what they're telling us, how we're translating that, yeah? Yeah, um, Also thinking about things like going into the home, what sort of resources they have within the home, um, what sorts of food we eat, just in terms of, you know, fe doing feeding therapy, and we're thinking, you know, when I did SOS and they're talking about veggie sticks and Cheetos, and I'm like, okay, give me corn curls. <laughs> <laughs> right? So you have to think about it in terms of the cultural aspect um, of how it affects our communities. You always the have vocabulary that you're using, vocabulary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. The vocabulary that we're using. Um, I There's so many things in those expressive vocabulary subtests that I'm... You know, I'm like, I do not know what, what is it, a totem pole or something like that in one of those. And some of those assessments, I complete, I give it right because I know they're not going to know it um, unless they've watched something absolutely familiar to that. So you always have to have that cultural competency in your mind. You also have to think about parents and, you know, what the family situation is like. Because mm -hmm. I might say, um, you know, go home and you can work on this, you could choose this activity and you can find a quiet area and you can work. But sometimes a lot of families aren't going to have that quiet area, mm -hmm. right? A lot of families might have, you know, six kids running around the house, it might have a few other family members. And we have to kind of think of how we can work it around that situation. We might think about, you know, going down the car when you're, you know, can you practice this one when you're driving in the car and you can point out these things. Whereas we're, you know, you're not thinking that this family takes public transportation, you know, they have to catch the bus and they have to, you know, their routine is completely different mm -hmm. from that Hannon textbook. Exactly. <laughs> that it might be. Yeah. So those are things you definitely have to take into consideration, the home environment and the syntax. I love what you share about syntax. You know, because yeah. here in Atlanta, that's something I make modifications for too when you're doing scoring and things like that. And have to be that's right. of that, especially we have a lot of Hispanic families in the Atlanta area and other um, di dialects and languages spoken as well. But when you're doing standardized assessments, it definitely needs to be um, in the native language when possible. And then to make the modifications or note the differences, make sure it's a disorder, not a difference, right? Not scoring yeah, things that's right. Right. the language difference. I think that's very important for all speech therapists to recall. Yeah. Do you adapt any specific materials that you purchase to better meet the needs of your clients? Or do you find yourself having to make materials to better meet the needs of your um, clients? I do both. Okay. Yeah, well, I do both. I love making resources. I love mm -hmm. making materials. So um, I make lots of books um, and I adapt them to suit. But I find that seeing that children here are so exposed to Americanized, you know, TV cartoons, it, a lot of it usually just, just falls in, you know, they can identify with it. So yeah, I do a little toys and everything. The world is really shrinking in, in a lot of ways, you know? It is, it is. It's like, you know, different countries and so forth, but we're definitely more connected, you know? Yeah. 
definitely would love you to share what do you think are some tips that would be beneficial for pediatric speech language pathologists to implement to ensure that they are providing equitable and culturally responsive services regardless of where they reside in practice. I think this is so important. Uh, yeah, for it all is. Therapists, regardless of where they live, you know. Yeah, it is very important. I think that culture plays a huge part in how you provide therapy, mm -hmm. and it plays an important part. And I always tell students this: your first goal is rapport, and it's not just with the child; it's with the family. So, being so culturally aware mm -hmm. helps to start to build that rapport. Show that, and it shows that you have that interest in them mm -hmm. and that interest in really supporting them and their needs as a holistic perspective, through a holistic perspective. Um, I think that building that rapport and being aware of their culture, being accepting and open and sharing parts of their culture, not in a condescending way either, um, really helps to you know, create that, that therapeutic relationship and it really makes therapy a lot easier, makes you know, better progress in therapy too. Yeah, so I think as over time as you get to know the children and the families, that rapport building, like you said, is very important, being able to make a connection with them. I always say, when you show kids and families that you care, they will rise to the occasion, right? Exactly. So that is a huge, huge, huge part of culturally responsive therapy, just being able to build those relationships with the children in an appropriate way and with the families, and then bring their culture in, you know, if it's a yeah. holiday or just different things that are important to them, it's always good to find out the kids' interests if they like certain toys and games and activities and with feeding therapy, certain types of food, knowing all those yeah. things, right? So regardless yeah. of whether a therapist is working with early intervention or if they're working with preschool children, um, school-age children, it's important for the therapist to really hone in on that and spend time with the parent interview. Yeah. I know with early intervention, um, I would do, actually in my private clinic, I would do a lot of it, um, evaluations with early, you know, birth to three population even in the last couple of years. And that parent interview is so important, right? Whether you're yeah. using a tool like the Rossetti or other tools, it's important to be able to um, gather good information about the home environment and developmental milestones and all those things and how you can, you know, ask different questions. I remember years ago, actually it wasn't that long ago, probably about two years ago, I have um, this some refugee population here in Atlanta in an area called Clarkston. And the family was, um, when they came in for the evaluation, they had, I had requested an interpreter interpreter services because they spoke Burmese, you know, mm. and one, you know, the one mother spoke one dialect, the, the mother spoke a dialect, and the father spoke a different dialect, and the interpreter spoke the dialect of the father, you know, so uh, we had to, tra you know, some translation thing that only one of the caregivers was able to really interact with the interpreter, but it's just important to get all that information up front, right, oh, yeah. so that you're exactly. able to um, communicate effectively, and that was a play-based, you know, evaluation for a, a two-year-old. Is severe, yeah. but it's just important to be able to have clear communication. So if you need an interpreter, use an interpreter, right? Definitely. That was a big um, thing in New Zealand too, because we had lots of um, Pacific Island families and I did play-based intervention assessment in Tongan and Samoan and Maori and so many different languages. And having that interpreter and having that relationship mm -hmm. with the interpreter too, to be able to tell them, to tell them, you know, you have to tell me exactly what the child's saying. Mm -hmm. You know, if the child's saying, you know, ride car, you, ha you can't say, you know, I want to ride car. You have to be able to, to tell us exactly what the child's saying. Definitely, definitely, definitely. This is just good information, you know, and it's just important for children and families, the families to know how important um, inter um, in early intervention services are, that they can be more aware of early intervention services. And then also just to be able for the therapist to know that they need to be more culturally responsive when they're providing evaluations and therapy services in early yeah. intervention. Consider the home environment and know that some of your expectations may be different, you know, than what the culturally is appropriate for that family, right? Sure. And they may not have access to certain toys, you know what I mean? So yeah. it's just being able to do it around mealtime or different things like that, it's important to be cognizant of that. Um, you know, and then for teletherapy services, we know that um, it can be effective, but it just depends on the, the disorder that you're serving, right? If there's a kid that has more behavioral needs, it may be more challenging, but just to be flexible. And I think 
in this COVID season, and we're kind of not quite post COVID season, but therapists are getting better with yeah. teletherapy services now, and a lot has returned to in person, you know, but just being fluid in our expectations. But at the end of the day, um, it's important for therapists to be able to give access, right? Making sure that whatever the child and family needs, that we can provide that access to them so they can um, build a successful life for themselves, you know, really um, build those communication and language skills. You know, right and um, make a difference you know yeah and build those friends and communication skills so lovely to have you on today to talk a little bit about diversity and early intervention and so forth you know and I wish you all the best with your um, continued private practice there in Barbados and that's wonderful that you're also providing teletherapy services um, and other items as well you know I think that's fantastic you know any final thoughts uh I just, I really like that you're doing this series, especially as it relates to, you know, creating that cultural awareness. I mean, especially in this time, it's so important, um, whether you're in the U.S., whether you're in the Caribbean, no matter where you are, to have that cultural, you know, that cultural awareness and that cultural acceptance and that cultural action, too, um, for, for all the families that are on your caseload. Yes, we have to acknowledge them and appreciate them. So yeah. not appropriate, but appreciate. So thank <laughs> yeah. you so much, Sharika. All the best to you and your clinic. Thank you.